You're listening to the Hayek Program podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. To learn about graduate student fellowship opportunities with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. Actually, it does dawn on me to, to, to say one thing more of a housekeeping thing. For those of you who don't know, we, we should have introduced ourselves. Uh, for those of you who don't, that's Roger Miners uh, at the end, professor of economics at UT Arlington. This is Susan Dudley, head of the uh, regulatory. What, the George, Washington George Washington. George Washington, but what's the name of the regulatory? Regulatory studies. Regulatory studies at, 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 at GW, a former colleague of mine at the Mercatus Center. Terry Anderson, emeritus professor at Montana State and founder of, of PERC. I'm Don Boudreau, um, friend of these people, <laughs> <laughs> and of Bruce. Uh, it doesn't feel right for me to sit down. I'm going to stand up when I'm talking to Bruce Yandel. <laughs> <laughs> he, he deserves the respect. Thank you all for being here. Um, Bruce has heard this story. Some of you also may have heard it. Uh, I was hired, actually here I have Roger Miners who hired me at Clemson and in the audience is Karen Vaughn who hired me at George Mason. And so I, I owe these people a debt. But when I, I was in law school when I got hired at Clemson and it was in 1992 and that was the, the day or an era when people had answering machines. It, we all know what that is. My students don't know what those are. <laughs> right. Had answering machines. And I remember I had just gotten the job offer at Clemson. I accepted it. And I got back home. And there was a message on the answering machine. And the message was from the late Fred McChesney. And he said, Don, I just heard you were hired at Clemson. He says, congratulations. You will be Bruce Yandel's colleague. That's what was significant <laughs> about being hired <laughs> at Clemson. And of course, that is what was significant about being hired at, at Clemson. I knew of Bruce a bit. I think we had met a few times, but I didn't know him very well until he and I became colleagues at Clemson. I was there for five years, and it was a great five years, Bruce. So if I reflect on who Bruce Yandel is and what he means, um, I come up with a few things. Um, he's an economist who understands that economics, to be relevant, has to be about the real world and not just about what other economists do. For those of you who aren't professional economists, you would be shocked to learn how much of what most professional economists do is has nothing to do with the real world. It's about what other economists do. They're tweaking each other's models and criticizing each other's models. Bruce doesn't do that. Bruce does work, has always done work that's relevant and helps us to better understand reality. Bruce also understands that we learn, all of us learn, through stories and metaphors, not just through abstract theorizing and mathematical equations. Bruce has the best stories, and the best jokes, and the best metaphors. And uh, the best accent. And the best accent. You just can't <laughs> compare to that. And the, and the best accent. And, and uh, uh, Bruce also, many of you in the room know this firsthand, Bruce also, unlike many of our colleagues in economics, Bruce always believed that teaching is a noble calling. It's not a tax, as I've heard <laughs> some people say. It's not a burden that uh, those of us who are fortunate enough to be in the academy bear. It is what we do. And Bruce was always committed to his students, and that shows in the quality of the students Bruce has produced over the years. Bruce also understands that teaching is also a form of learning. As Bruce has a, a, an enviable record of co-authorships with his students, again, some of whom are in the audience today. I was at Clemson from 1992 to 1997, and uh, 
while I was there, my one and only child was born. And my, my wife and I knew that we'd only have one child. And so we didn't want to name the child my name of my family and then of, of my wife's family because one would get jealous or envious of the other. So there were two people at Clemson who made a big impact on our lives, Bruce Yandel and the late Hugh McCauley. And uh, Bruce's first name, of course, is Thomas. Most, a lot of people don't know that. I knew that. We knew that. And so when our son was born in 1997, we named him Thomas Macaulay Boudreau, after Bruce and Hugh Macaulay. Um, our admiration of the British historian Thomas Babington Macaulay had also something to do with that too. <laughs> but it wasn't that wasn't the main that wasn't the main reason. Um, those of you who know Bruce, and those of you who will get to know him over the next 24 hours, you can look at him. He is the consummate Southern gentleman. There's nothing radical about him. He looks like a country club Republican. <laughs> One of the things I love about Bruce is that he's radical. <laughs> and, 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 and I mean that as a compliment. Bruce takes his values and his economics seriously. He doesn't trim as is said today. I remember a story, but some of you remember this. Uh, and this is one of the many reasons why we all love you, uh, this sort of thing. You were um, emceeing or, or monitoring or moderating an event at the Strom Thurmond Center many years ago. And there was a candidate for a House seat from the upstate who was in the audience. And I remember you telling, I wasn't there, I remember you telling me the story. This candidate kept raising his hand. He wanted to speak. <laughs> and, and you wouldn't call on him. <laughs> because you knew that he was a candidate for office and you didn't think he had anything worthwhile to say. That candidate is now Senator Lindsey Graham. <laughs> 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 Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. And, and um, and so uh, uh, this, this consummate gentleman, this great scholar, uh, uh, has this radical core which attracts those of us who are genuinely committed to free markets and free minds. And no one, no one that I know of, that I've ever, whom I've ever met, has done more over the past half century to promote a society of free markets and free minds than has Bruce Yandel. This small gathering, this small celebration that we're doing over this small period of time is wholly inadequate, wholly inadequate to, to celebrate all that you are and all that you have done. But I think I speak for us all in saying we're mighty thankful that you are who you are, that you've done what you've done, that you continue to do what you do, and that we are all your friends. <laughs> Thank you. I'll uh, remain seating out of seated out of convenience. Uh, if Bruce were to walk up here, I would stand up, and that would be about the only time I'd be taller than him <laughs> would be standing on this stage. Uh, uh, indeed, uh, Bruce stands tall in so many ways and Don has already described some of them. Uh, I, I was talking to my son about coming out here for this, and uh, uh, he, he even remembers, and I remember it so well, and this is one of the, the changes that occurred in Bruce that was really too bad, probably good for his health, but too bad for, for me at least, and, and my son remembers. Uh, I visited Clemson for part of a year, and uh, at that time, Bruce was a pipe smoker, and really one of the things I remember about Bruce when I met him was I just loved it because he had this pipe that he just it smelled so good I didn't want to become a pipe smoker <laughs> I wanted him to you know go ahead and bear the cost but I'd get the benefits and my son who was I think uh, six at the time just worshipped Bruce and he just you know and we were we were he my son of course had never never been to this part of the world and and I think we went to Colonial Williamsburg a little bit north uh, and uh, we were walking around and there was a little shop and there was this tiny little porcelain pipe 
And he thought, Dad, can I buy that for Bruce? <laughs> and he still remembers that pipe smoking Bruce Yandel. Uh, thank goodness Bruce stopped. That probably has helped uh, his longevity. And I look at him today and think maybe I should have smoked a pipe and stopped, and I would be as, as healthy looking as he is. Uh, uh, Don mentioned uh, Bruce as the teacher, and and when, when he was saying that, I thought, uh, it's not, not like you think of a teacher and students in a classroom at a university. Anybody who's had any interaction with Bruce knows he's the teacher. And I, I uh, will talk about this as the time goes on uh, the next uh, day or so as we're uh, reading these papers, but uh, I don't know how many times in graduate school and after graduate school I read the article famous social cost article by Ronald Coase and thought I understood it and it really was not until I met Bruce and heard Bruce talk several times probably because I'm dense uh, that I really learned what that piece was about and you know, it, 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 it has infected my scholarship I, would, I hope affected it in good ways uh, and, and been just a, a totally revolutionary change in the way I think about economics and I was probably 10 years out of graduate school before I got that lesson. So, so I was a student of Bruce's and, and uh, in that regard and thank him for it. I was also a student of Bruce's uh, and not many people maybe think of Bruce as an entrepreneur, but uh, he truly is, uh, obviously in education. And uh, he, was, he, he helped me so much uh, as I was uh, president of an organization in Montana called the Property and Environment Research Center, PERC. And uh, uh, I don't, I, I think we probably met at a Liberty Fund meeting first. That's where almost all of us <laughs> met the first time, I think. Uh, uh, but Bruce uh, got involved with PERC at a fairly early time and, and wrote lots of papers uh, with, through PERC and contributed in many ways to the scholarly output of PERC. But there were two things that Bruce, and they both relate to teaching, two, two, two things we did at PERC that were so important to that organization and so important to, to the students who, who got involved. One is we organized a student seminar. Uh, in the summer, we would bring about, uh, I don't know, probably 30 to 40 young students in. And, and Bruce actually managed to recruit Adam Smith and I'm thinking, my God, this is a really <laughs> impressive guy. He can bring Adam Smith back to come to our student <laughs> seminar. Uh, that, you know, we all know, uh, uh, and I was talking to Adam as we came in. Uh, that was quite a few years ago. Adam was hardly 20, I think. And, uh, but uh, in, in organizing that program and having Bruce there, he, he just uh, exemplified everything that Don talked about. Uh, and that's kind of the classic, classic teacher that Bruce, Bruce is in an economic sense. But one of the other programs that we had at PERC uh, was, I get some credit for it, undeservedly. Uh, it all really goes to Bruce. And it was a program that we called our Enviropreneur Institute. Environmentalists who wanted to be entrepreneurial in, a, in the approach to their environmental issues. And Bruce and I uh, were invited to meet with uh, a, a family foundation and talk to them about how they could do leadership for environmentalists. And so Bruce and I went and met them outside of Chicago, as I recall. And, uh, you know, I was all about, you know, I'm going to teach them about free markets and, and, uh, and so on. But Bruce, being Bruce, was far more subtle far less pushy, and far more entrepreneurial. It was Bruce who, who, who went to the Kinship Foundation with me and, and really opened the doors uh, for the Envirepreneur Institute, created it in, in many ways, and, uh, and, and as a result, uh, I think had a huge impact, not just on the way some of us think about environmental issues, but certainly how some of these Envirepreneurs think about them. Uh, I, I think Stephanie sent us all an email saying, oh, talk, 
here's some talking points you might might want to address. And and the last two she sent were, what advice do you have for young graduate students, and and what does the future look like for public choice? And uh, the, you know the the last one I I just wrote down bleak. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but the, the, here's you know again this comes back to what Don said, and I'll, I. Uh, I think it, it, it really describes Bruce, and, it, and, it's, and it's, it, it's the lesson I would, I would tell any young uh, economist to, to pursue. I came across a quote from uh, Zvi Grilicus. Uh, some of the old people in this room will remember a Chicago economist, uh, econometrician in those early days. Uh, and he's quoted as saying, the cost of computing has dropped exponentially. And of course, this he wrote back, you know, 30, 40 years, 50 years ago. So think how much it's dropped since. Has dropped exponenti uh, exponentially, but the cost of thinking is what it always was. <laughs> Bruce has never let the econometrics be the sink that it can be. He thinks. And my advice to anybody starting an economics or any other career for that matter would be follow in Bruce's footsteps. Think. Man, these are tough acts to follow. Um, I feel like I met Bruce later than others and later in my career. So I had already worked in government for a while. And my, my non-governmental and non-Bruce education was in much more traditional. Uh, so I, I went to MIT, the Sloan School, and I studied economics at UMass before that. Um, so when I worked in government, and I went there to correct market failures and to um, to make the environment a better place through more regulation. And I was stunned by how that wasn't the way it worked. You know, why were we following policies that didn't make sense? We'd done the, we'd analyzed the benefits and costs, we knew what the right approach was, and then the wrong approach was taken. And it wasn't until I left and met Bruce, or maybe I read Bruce before I met Bruce, that it just, it was like a light bulb went off. It was the bootleggers and the Baptists that had worked together to create these policies that suited them, but really weren't in the interest of the environment or, or, or the very people that it was supposed to help. So meeting Bruce, um, I mean, he's, he is as, um, as kind and generous as, as the others have said. And um, I also, I loved what you said about even if he wasn't your teacher, he was your teacher. So he was not my professor, but Bruce has been my teacher even though um, I wasn't lucky enough to have that teaching until later in my life. I think the first time that I met you, and I'm not sure, was at a chief of staff retreat that Mercatus used to put on in those days. Um, and just hearing you speak then, I just, I wanted to emulate that. I wanted to be able to be like that. And it took me a while to realize that I would ne was never going to be a distinguished Southern gentleman <laughs> standing six <laughs> foot something tall. Um, and so I had to figure out what could I learn from Bruce and adopt myself. And, so, and I think part of it is, I mean, it's the thinking. It's the thinking and it's applying these, you know, thinking through the theory and then seeing where it applies. So once you hear about bootleggers and Baptists, and I love talking to my students now, colleagues in government, um, et cetera, once they hear that, they realize, oh my goodness, it is everywhere. Now I see it. Um, it so where was I headed with that? Um, <laughs> but that's part, it's, it's not only being able to do that, because you can have a rather dry theory, but it's being able to make it so that, um, to tell stories that go with it. And that's how you can communicate to people and be very persuasive to people who don't necessarily share your world view. So I, um, I, was, I enjoyed reading the papers um, that have been, are being put together for this best shrift, is that how you pronounce it? Um, and Todd wrote one, that he, Todd Zwicky wrote one where he talked about one of your early books where you um, talked about souls, conflict, divisions, and um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Now, I shouldn't admit to this group, I have not read either, but now I'm going to <laughs> after reading Todd's paper on Bruce's work. Um, but that's, I think that's it. Bruce has always been able to capture both, capture the attention of both those with the unconstrained and the constrained vision. And I think that's what's been such a powerful 
uh, that's always, I mean, that is a powerful legacy that you have. Um, so in, in my career, he, so even, so after I met him, I've been back in government, I've um, started a, a new academic center, and in all the things that I have done, you have always been so supportive. Supportive of me, but also wanting to be, meet my students, meet the young people that I work with, which is such a treat. I wish that we all lived closer because, you know, when Bruce calls and says, I'm going to be in town, have you got some young people that we could, I'll take you out to pizza? It's always th the biggest excitement about <laughs> who gets to go <laughs> and how you do that. So um, that's a wonderful thing. Um, I too, I'm gonna follow Stephanie's suggestion of some. So um, where do I think public choice is going in the future, is needed most? I think, I'll, I'll just mention two areas. One, uh, maybe, yeah, so dismal may be the forecast, but I have a, a positive as opposed, oh no, a normative as opposed to a positive <laughs> comment on it. Um, and I think it's the rise of behavioral economics. So I think a behavioral public choice that applies um, the, the, the public choice insights to the regulators, to the institutions. And that's something I've been very interested in, having been in institutions, which kind of structures can better counter the bootleggers and the vaxes. So I think that's a very important thing that, um, and I'm hopeful that the rise of the public, of the behavioral literature suggests that we should, it, we can intervene in markets um, to correct people's, the errors that they make in their judgments, their heuristics, their biases, without recognizing that the regulators themselves have those same biases and the institutions in which they operate may magnify those biases. So I think that's an important area that people should go. The other is applying it to the techno you know, technological change, this rapid advance in computing power, et cetera. That's an exciting area that bootleggers and Baptists can capture and squelch innovation. And so I think these insights will be important for that. And then for students, um, be respectful. You know, learn from Bruce, be respectful. Um, listen to other ideas and truly listen to them. You can't listen if all you're listening is listening long enough so that you can think of a good rebuttal. <laughs> so I think that that respect and kindness is um, something that I've learned from Bruce and I try to share with younger people. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to be sure at, at the outset here so that this doesn't get passed over that the uh, primary a sponsor of, of this program is the Searle Freedom Foundation. And uh, Kim Dennis said she was sorry that she couldn't be here, but just thought it was a wonderful event. And when Don and I uh, were first discussing it, and we bounced back and forth uh, ideas about, well, who should, we, who should we ask to participate? Nobody said no. <laughs> and that's, that's very unusual. Uh, it, we're always, of course, we're invited to too many things, but this was a, a special meeting so many people. Uh, Stephanie said, well, where did you meet Bruce? And I remember it was at a, a Liberty Fund at, uh, here in Atlanta. It was at Emory while I was uh, there for a while. And it was the first time I'd met Bruce. Bruce and what was astonishing for a, for a northerner to see is that here was a uh, southerner who could uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Bruce has often said, uh, people know that uh, deep people from the deep south can't do those two things uh, <laughs> together. But Bruce could, and he was not a patrician southerner, he is a real southerner, and uh, maintains the, the courtliness that, that we would all hope. And when I told my wife that I was coming, she said, well, the thing I remember most about Bruce is uh, that uh, several of our kids were born in Greenville, uh, next to, uh, to Clemson, and after our daughter was born, who should walk into the hospital about 10 in the morning the next day but Bruce? And she said, you know, she was laying there by herself, uh, having the normal little postpartum unhappiness, and uh, Bruce brightened up things and pointed out that our daughter's name was the same as his mother's, Molly, and so that was a uh, special, unplanned relationship, <laughs> unlike Don's, which was uh, <laughs> uh, very well planned relationship. After uh, I'd been at Emory, then Bruce and I were at the FTC together. He was, of course, the executive director, and I was lucky enough to be uh, in Atlanta instead of having to go up to the, uh, the swamp and uh, be a part of that. So 
But he, I did report to him, and I remembered once I got a letter from him. This is pre-internet days, so there's no emails. I got about a two-page long letter, and I read it, and I thought, what is the purpose of this letter? And it just seems kind of vague, vague as I read it again, I said, wait a minute, there's some criticism embedded in here, or some <laughs> advice to me that's embedded here. And finally, after reading it three times, I realized that I was being reprimanded for some dumb thing I'd done, and Bruce's reprimand was, was so gentle when it probably should have been, you know, a smack upside the head and say, look, you idiot, you're going to get in trouble if you keep doing this kind of stuff. So he was certainly a, a wonderful and perhaps too kind boss, but I will say that when there was serious trouble, Bruce was the adult in the room escorting some people out of their office. Uh, they were gone because it had to be dealt with. And I know that when he was uh, uh, dean at Clemson, there was also instances like that. And it's the kind of thing that too many managers shy away from, that responsibility that when the hammer's got to be dropped, it's something that needs to be done. You might try to do it in a kindly manner, but get the job done. Well, after the FTC, uh, Bruce and I were at Clemson, of course, Bruce a much longer time. I was there for uh, about eight years, and we did five books together. We just edited what other people wrote. We were too lazy to do the work <laughs> ourselves. Uh, and most of these were due to Terry at, at Perk. They were Perk-based books, but they were always fun to work with, uh, Bruce, because as you all know, he gives everybody sound advice and careful and thoughtful advice on how to improve uh, their work. But everybody is focused on the nice things of Bruce, but of course there's always a dark side. <laughs> it's just human nature uh, that there is, and I can report on that because I have been the victim of it. When I was at Clemson, one time Bruce said, why don't we team teach a class next semester? Well, that's great. <laughs> I thought, until about 15 minutes into the first period, listening to Bruce lecture, I thought, I am screwed. <laughs> it doesn't matter how well I sing and dance, these kids will, of course, like Bruce so much better, uh, because they were being compared side by side. And so I was always sure that was a setup <laughs> as a way to, uh, to take me down by doing that. But not many people in academics volunteer that kind of thing. You know, let's share this experience, and of course Bruce was a very serious teacher. It comes off as being effortless, but it's always well planned and thought out in advance. Um, and that's the, one of the points that, uh, that Todd makes in his paper, is the importance of clear communication. And Bruce does, as uh, Susan just said, communicate information in such an attractive manner to non-technical economists, which is a very, very small subset of the world, fortunately. And it, his, it makes for much more interesting learning and if we can relate to the parables that are being told as a part of getting the uh, information and the, the message across. And so he had a profound impact on many people, as, as Todd explains in his paper, superior communication skill and the importance of being clear in communicating. And I know that the people here are all very good communicators, and that's one reason they're friends of Bruce's, is because they appreciate the value of good communication in professional writing, in teaching, uh, and the other ways we communicate with uh, the larger world. Probably the, the best thing I ever got to work on with Bruce, and we did a lot of different books and, and stuff, was a paper we wrote called something like Common Law Environmentalism. Terry's frequently blamed for founding free market environmentalism, which for years, if you would say that, people would laugh. I mean, it's, a, it's just an oxymoron. I mean, free market environmentalism. But now economists don't laugh anymore. So I really thought you should give up the term for a while because it just seemed to elicit such scorn, but it doesn't anymore. And Bruce and I were invited to write a piece for the George Mason Law Review on common law environmentalism, so we went through and researched a bunch of, you know, the old tort rules and so on that applied in property law that dominated the environmental area 
prior to the advent of the state monster that took place starting in 1970 and the, the flood of environmental statutes. And I think we discovered over the years that uh, most lawyers and most law students think the world started in 1970. Before that, everybody was drowning in toxic chemicals and uh, you know, the world was getting worse and worse and worse. And so oddly enough, that was the one paper that um, uh, we almost didn't write that uh, has had more impact for me than anything is trying to resurrect common law rules that had dominated for so many hundreds of years and, and helped to develop uh, our system. And there has been somewhat of a resurgence to it as we have Don and I and Terry have sent in articles to law reviews. Sometimes the student editors say, I've never read anything like this before. This is fascinating. Can you send us another paper? Because all they've ever heard is, you know, the need for more of the kind of regulations that Susan has spent her career trying to dampen down a bit. Uh, the, boot, the bootleggers and the Baptists getting together running through more environmental regulations. So we have had uh, little impact there. But in recent years, I think Bruce's abilities have slipped, and we see that because he writes more about macro. <laughs> and I, I got an email, I think it was yesterday, of his uh, economic forecast. <laughs> uh, kind of shameful work, but, uh, you know, and, he, and he's got all the, the talk down about, well, we got to be cautious in this area, and well, things are on the move, but you never know, and so on. <laughs> Uh, so, it, micro is not like that, Bruce. You know that. You can't put all these, these, these qualifiers in it. But, but Bruce, Bruce gave me one bit of great advice. He said, if you're talking to some group that you're in, invited to, and it's often the case that uh, if you tell people you're an economist, then they all think you do mindless macro work. And he said, if somebody asks you a question like, what's going to happen, what do you think is going to happen to interest rates? give them a specific answer. Say, I think they're going to go up a half a percent over the next six months. Now, we don't have a clue if it is or not, but don't give them this econ mumbo jumbo of, well, it depends on this and the impact. Of this. They don't like that. They want a specific answer, and luckily, nobody really listens to economists. So it's not like they go out and bet the farm on this advice about what is going to happen to interest rates. Uh, people are sensible enough not to pay much attention to us. Uh, but as, as Don and Terry have noted, uh, while Bruce is a wonderful scholar, teaching has always been most important to and uh, the, the feeling, the belief that he had that those students are paying money for a good reason and they should be given a good educational experience. Sometimes they, they resisted. I remember one time Bruce was telling a class that they were going to have a conversation about something, but it was kind of a one-way conversation. And so finally Bruce went and had to close the door to the classroom and said, let me repeat, we are going to have a conversation here that is going to go in both directions. Uh, so sometimes it takes a little while to get the message across, but of course Bruce's students, which include all of us, have learned so much. And unfortunately, none of us uh, up here right now are at Clemson, and so I'd, I'd ask if Skip Sauer would come up because Skip had a lot of interaction years at Clemson and was chair of the econ department for a long time, and I think Skip could say something about Bruce as a teacher at Clemson would be a good add-on. If, if I can. If <laughs> if he, make up something, Skip. You're good at it. If, <laughs> if I can, well, before Skip starts, I, I, I have to interject. I, hearing Susan t talk about Bruce's stories. I, he's got all these great stories about the, the FTC and you know other environmental issues he's been involved in. But when you said stories, immediately I started thinking about the jokes that he, the litany of jokes he had about graffiti on <laughs> bathroom <laughs> walls. Man, I mean those, at, you know, if, if you have one more article in you, Bruce, <laughs> put all those down so we can use them. They are uh, priceless and only Bruce could deliver it. I tried and tried. I'd take notes when he's doing them and I'd get up the next speech I was giving and, and I'd think, man, this is really going to in there, you know, I'd get a couple of chuckles, but nothing <laughs> like Bruce. He could do it. He was a master. What about us grills? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of E-I-E-I-O. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I'd like to just add one more thing. Part of what makes Bruce so wonderful is, I think it's more than just Bruce, it is the family that he has. And I think Dot's presence, because I've been lucky enough to get to see, even though I've never lived in South Carolina or Georgia, South Georgia, I've gotten, I've gotten to know Dot because Dot also joins on these pizza dinners with the students. And that has meant a lot to me too. And also getting to know their grandson. And I finally found the missing, met the missing link in between <laughs> and Catherine today. So um, that's, I think we're honoring not just Bruce, but also the people who have supported Bruce through these years. Um, I, I have just a couple of things yeah. that I, I'd like to add. Um, uh, first of all, um, well, these are in no particular order, but except that they come to me. Uh, uh, Bruce introduced me to Adam Smith when Adam Smith was about 10, <laughs> I think. And uh, when I was chairman of the economics department, I was talking to Bruce, and he mentioned that, uh, that your grandson was applying to our graduate program. And I remember going back to one of my colleagues and saying, you know, Bruce Yandel just recommended Adam Smith <laughs> to our program, there is no way <laughs> we can turn this guy down. I mean, he, he would have gotten it anyway, but <laughs> but Bruce Yandel recommending Adam Smith, it just, it's, it's, it's perfect. I used to run for many years the annual public choice outreach seminar at George Mason. This is a week long, well at the time it was a week long seminar, a five day long seminar where we would bring um, uh, undergraduates, some graduate students to George Mason uh, to learn, to introduce them to, to public choice scholarship because outside of George Mason and Clemson and a handful of other uh, schools such as uh, uh, Florida State, public choice just isn't, isn't taught and so the, the, the future is, 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 is bleak because people ignore it. It's, it's very handy to ignore it. And uh, so we, we had this seminar, it's been going on, I think Dwight, Lee is the one who started it many years ago, back in, the, back in 1983 or thereabouts. And I ran it for many years. And when I ran it, I had Bruce come up for several years to be one of the featured speakers. Um, and uh, I, by the way, I feel bad to this day that at the time we ran it, we were on a shoestring budget, and so we had our speakers uh, staying in dorm rooms. <laughs> and so here's Bruce Yandel, <laughs> you know, senior professor at Clemson, staying in a dorm room. At, at George Mason, so thank you for that, Bruce. But that's not the that's not the point of the story. <laughs> One of the that's other speakers. Yeah. <laughs> See how the other half lives. Yeah. Uh, One of the other speakers that I had for many years, along with Bruce, was a former law professor of mine at the University of Virginia, a guy named Saul Levmore. Uh, Saul Levmore went on to become the dean of the law school at the University of Chicago. He's no, no small thinker. And I remember talking to Levmore after lunch or during lunch after one of Bruce's talks. And Bruce mentioned the point that he, you and he made in the article that you referenced, Roger, the, the, the common law of the environment. And, and uh, Saul Levmore, PhD from Yale, law degree from Yale, on the faculty at Virginia Law, headed off to become dean of the University of Chicago Law School, said, you know, I never heard that before. That's really interesting, <laughs> right? I mean, he was impressed. He never heard And so I'm thinking, you know, what's, it's not just the students that we're teaching stuff to. It's, it's prominent law professors that we're, 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 teaching, we're teaching things to. So thank you for that, Bruce. Yeah. So Bruce, you, you became an economist not from the start. You had a a career before that. So how, how, how was the economics profession so fortunate to uh, land you? What, what, what happened? It's a long story. <laughs> 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 the, uh, and, and I'll make some comments uh, in my session tomorrow, not so much about that, but indirectly about it. But um, uh, I attended Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. And uh, as was common at that time, uh, I wor as they say, I worked my way through college, which was just commonplace. Uh, most people did. So I had a part-time job after my classes. But after graduating, I stayed with this small company and became a part of it. And so for 15 years, 
I was in the industrial machinery business uh, and had an office not too far from where we are right here on Northside Drive, very close to the Tech campus. I had always wanted to teach. And so a time came where I had an opportunity to say okay and uh, lots of conversations with Dot. I had three children who were uh, eager and active. We were living on the north side of Atlanta here where we had lived for about 10 years. <clears throat> and so basically the question is, well, what if I sell my interest in business, see if I can get into a graduate school, and uh, then with a goal of teaching at some small school or anywhere. I just wanted to be in the classroom. And so that was how it started. Uh, Georgia State had a young PhD program. We lived here. Uh, it made all the sense in the world to be there and they were kind enough to accept me. And the first semester I was at Georgia State, keep in mind now I hadn't been in a classroom in more than a decade. The first semester I took a course, the course was monetary theory. John Klein, who was a Friedman student, was teaching the class. And uh, so there I am sitting in this class on monetary theory and somebody asks John Klein a question and he says, that's a very good question. I doubt that even Milton Friedman could answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I punched the guy next to me and I said, who is this guy Friedman is? <laughs> <laughs> Is, is he on the faculty here <laughs> or? Uh, <laughs> I didn't know anything. Uh, but it was, and I had, uh, uh, in some cases, some of my professors were so boring that when they talked, chalk dust would fall out of their mouths. It was, uh, it was pretty bad. And that same semester, I took a course, and the title of the course was Theory of the Firm. Oh, boy, I thought this is going to really be fun. I've been running a business here in Atlanta for 10 years. I know about firms and so <laughs> forth. Well, after uh, two weeks of looking at constrained Lagrangians <laughs> and, and second order conditions, I began to wonder, is this, does this have anything to do with, with what I have been doing? And so uh, in telling you this story, it gets you to the really the point of the story. It was during breaks between classes that I began to find uh, humor uh, written on the bathroom walls <laughs> there at Georgia State. They did not have a large budget for maintenance and cleaning <laughs> walls. And at that particular time, people were writing continued stories on bathroom walls. Has anyone in here ever seen that? <laughs> You're George, do they still do it? <laughs> <laughs> And so there would be someone who was sitting there and they would write in all of this fictional account of something and stop and then someone else would come and the color of the ink would change, the handwriting <laughs> would change and the stories would continue. And so Sounds I like really, law, pardon? Like <laughs> <laughs> it is, it's, it's people made. Um, uh, as Wordsworth say uh, in his definition of uh, poetry, an overflow of emotions recollected in tranquility. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, so I began to appreciate the bathroom poets. Um, and uh, then there's a long story that unfolds from that point. But I was going to mention, you commented about uh, my smoking a pipe, which I did for many, many years. And my daughter who is here this evening, I'm so glad that, uh, that my family is here, um, uh, had trouble with car sickness when she was a little girl and I, <laughs> you know, never, I never connected the pipe smoking with the car sickness uh, <laughs> for, for some reason. Uh, but I stopped smoking and I think the car sickness sort of went away for a lot of people. <laughs> but uh, uh, Roger Miners is the reason that I quit smoking a pipe and that's probably, uh, for better or worse, the reason I'm still alive right now. <laughs> But uh, Dot and I had a wonderful opportunity to go out to Bozeman and spend uh, a, a semester, and Roger and Carrie have this wonderful home on Kelly Canyon Road in Bozeman, Montana, a truly beautiful place. And so uh, Dot and I were interested in going out for the fall and winter, early winter. We would be returning in December. 
And uh, so Roger began to tell me what the rules were, and he says, well, there are several rules about the house, but one is that really applies to you. <laughs> we do not allow anyone to smoke in our house. <laughs> so uh, if you're going to bring your pipes out here, you're welcome to sit on the porch or uh, <laughs> do whatever you want to, but no smoking in the house. And I said, okay. Well, when the temperatures got to be down about zero, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> You know, here I was sitting out on the side porch uh, <laughs> looking at uh, a, a wonderful bird that would come up, a Clark nutcracker, looking at some of the bird life there. And here I am about to freeze to death smoking <laughs> my pipe. And I think, you know, this doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, and then there were some other interventions, but it was Roger's rule about not smoking in his house and then the deadly winters there in Bozeman <laughs> that combined. And so I just gave it up cold turkey. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. <laughs> so for maybe like the three of you that didn't get all the jokes, um, I'm Adam Smith, Adam <laughs> C. Smith, not related to the absent-minded professor we all adore, um, <clears throat> but I was named after. So I, I just wanted to say, you know, first, thank you for inviting me to this. Um, uh, as, a, as an author for the book chapter, I was really excited to do that project. And there's a lot of things I could say about my grandfather's influence on my scholarship. And, and I would also say, to echo um, what you all are saying, his influence on other people. Because so many of you in the room, you know, my, my uncles, my uh, Todd Zawicki, uh, Don, okay, getting me into George Mason, Susan. There's just so many people, again, that have been very influential to my life. So it was your thank grandfather you. who got you into George Mason. Well, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like my name did a lot, too. So, um, But I wanted to tell one story um, that I think about my grandfather a lot. I don't know if I've even told him about it. Um, that, that's, that has nothing to do with academics and is long before any of that. You know, I should say that I still think of him, even though I've probably been in the post-college space longer now, I still think of him as the grandfather of my childhood. So the grandfather of my childhood, one time we were out in um, <coughs> Round Oak and uh, in Georgia, where we spent a lot of time as our family. And um, like, uh, well, probably like even up to present day, I found myself feeling very out of sync with authority figures in my life, and in this case being my grandfather. And so I'm running around the yard and doing, you know, whatever, whatever six-year-olds do, was well, six at the time. And um, we're in the flower beds. And um, I think, I don't know, I was messing with the flowers too much or something. And so he just, he just stopped me. And he, um, he pulls out these bulbs. And he says, Adam, you know, look at these bulbs for a moment. And, you know, I stopped my you know, hummingbird way, I guess, and, and you know, looked at the bulbs. And he said, you know, they're bulbs, but do you, do you think about why they are there and why they look the way they do? You know, and again, I can't remember the exact words, but it's just, it was the meaning of it. Do you ever think about what's behind the bulb, the meaning behind the bulb, why the things are the way they are in this world? And um, I still remember that so well, you know, it was just a real change of my mind to think of things as just being in front of me, two things being something that there is meaning behind that we as human beings can discover. Um, and I'd like to think that that's the, the power of his influence, that that's always his, been his approach, not so much politics, so not so much rah, 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 and, and Lindsey Graham and all that, right? <laughs> it's, um, it's about why are things the way they are? What is the meaning behind our world, and what can we do about that? So I, I appreciate that, that legacy you've given to me. Thank you. <coughs> I should have uh, begun my earlier comments by an expression of deep appreciation uh, for, for this event, the effort that has been made by those who planned it and the generosity of those who funded it and for wonderful colleagues uh, with whom I've had the opportunity to work, teach, have fun with, co-author, uh, learn together all of those come together, but you know, as I was sitting here listening to these wonderful comments, what came to my mind was that wonderful story <coughs> by Mark Twain in The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. You remember that Tom Sawyer and his friend Huckleberry Finn and their buddy Joe uh, went out on their raft on the Mississippi and didn't come home. 
and uh, the town folks and the kin folks worried and worried and they did not come home. Uh, so they sent out all kinds of searches and dynamited the river in a hope that maybe the boat sank and maybe we'll find their bodies. And they ultimately decided they would just have to have a funeral. And so there was this funeral and all of these wonderful things were being said by the preacher and other people who were giving eulogies about Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. They were not saying anything about Joe. But, uh, you know, as Twain tells it, he said they were just saying all kinds of things that under ordinary circum circumstances you would just refer to those as rascalities, uh, <laughs> deserving of the rawhide whip. <laughs> but all of a sudden, everybody was thinking what wonderful people these were. And so as the preacher became more eloquent and the crowd became more caught up in it, uh, well, lo and behold, the three boys, without anyone being aware of it at the church that day, walk in the back door. And so here's the sermon going, and here come the three guys walking down the aisle. And lo and behold, when the congregation sees them, they stop and embrace them and tell them what wonderful young people they are. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, so, as Tom Sawyer closes out the story, he said, it was the greatest day of my life, <laughs> <coughs> which is how I feel right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the Hayek Program, visit hayek.mercatus.org. For more information about graduate student fellowship opportunities for students at Mason as well as at universities across the globe, please visit students.mercatus.org. We hope you recommend students to our programs or consider applying yourself.